Hi, my name is Corey Noxon. I'm a senior researcher at the ritz macon Global Innovation Research Organization here in Kyoto and a special research fellow at the Lake Biwa Museum. I study Jomon period archaeology and a lot of my research has focused on population and residential mobility. My presentation is titled Investigating the Middle Jomon Boom and Bust Population Pattern in the Kanto and Chuba Regions of Japan. And this research was a part of my PhD dissertation. Today, I want to talk a bit about the research, uh, the results, and talk about ways in which I tried to ensure the reproducibility of the project and some difficulties encountered in that process. First, for some background information, the Jomon period follows the Paleolithic period in Japan and spanned over 13,000 years. It's typically divided into six main subdivisions that you see here. And the focus of this particular presentation is the Middle Jomon period, which spanned around 1,000 years, running from 5400 to 4400 Cal BP. Jomon population estimations began in the 1960s. Uh, Chosuke Sarizawa initially estimated the Jomon period population to be around 120,000 at its peak. In 1964, Sugao Yamanuchi provided a higher estimation that ranged between 150,000 and 250,000 individuals. And in 1978, uh, Shuzo Koyama provided an estimate that was even higher, uh, but this time based on a new methodology. Uh, Koyama's estimate was using a combination of archaeological site counts and 8th century population records to estimate how many people could be represented by each site. Um, he additionally introduced an adjustment factor to compensate for differences in site and dwelling sizes. On top of his methodological advances, Koyama's study was also the first to identify the Middle Jomon boom and bust phenomenon that occurred in the Kanto Chubu regions, seen here with the red and blue spike centered around 5,000 Cal BP. This boom and bust pattern has been identified in a number of different ways. Uh, Keiji Imamura identified the pattern using pit houses in the Kanto and Chuba regions, this time showing the change in 100 year time blocks. Kenichi Yano identified a similar peak at the prefecture level in Nagano using both the number of pit houses and the number of sites. And Enrico Crema and others identified the pattern in the Kanto region using some probability distribution of radiocarbon dates. While each new line of evidence helps to support the case for a middle Jomon boom and bust, um, my concern, and one that was discussed in most of these studies, was that all of these methods are susceptible to bias caused by changes in residential mobility. By increasing the number of locations where people live throughout the year, you increase the number of sites and dwellings they used. Um, an increase in the number of sites identified by archaeologists can in return increase the need for more radiocarbon tests to directly date these sites. Basically, we needed a line of evidence that was less susceptible to changes in residential mobility. This search led me to Boquetapel's Juvenility Index. The Juvenility Index uses skeletal data to compare the number of sub-adults to the population at large to create a birth rate proxy value. The number of sub-adults aged 5 to 19 is divided by the total population over the age of 5, producing a 15p5 or Juvenility Index value. Essentially, the greater proportion of subadults in the population should reflect a greater birth rate. In this calculation, um, subadults under the age of five are not included due to generally poor preservation and representation in the archaeological record. Um, a key benefit of this method is that it's tied directly to the individuals themselves and not the amount of material they produced. I first investigated this in my master's thesis, where I gathered data on over 1,700 individuals from 97 sites that spanned across the entirety of the Jomon period. I additionally investigated the effects that sample size had on these index values, and I examined data on both a nationwide scale and a regional scale that focused on the Kanto and Chubu regions. The results of those initial analyses are shown here. Um, the plots on the left show juvenility index values for all of Japan, while the plots on the right specifically focus on the Kanto and Chuba regions. As I mentioned earlier, different sample size minimum thresholds were tested. The top plots required five or more individuals at a site to be included in the analysis. The bottom left plots required 10 or more individuals. 
and the bottom right plots required 15 or more individuals. The results showed fluctuations, but as the confidence intervals never left the stable population line, I was unable to show any statistically significant changes in juvenility index levels. So just to simplify things, essentially the dotted horizontal line represents the stable population line for that measure. Values above that line indicate popula positive population growth and values below indicate negative growth. The lowest regression lines um, rises and falls in a somewhat similar manner to previous population estimates. But when you look at the 95% confidence interval level in uh, identified by the blue arrows here, there's never a point in which that entire interval range goes above or below the stable population line. Uh, this means that the data didn't show a statistically significant deviation from a relatively stable population level. In short, this analysis didn't do much to confirm or refute the concept of a middle Jomon population boom and bust, and I still wasn't certain if residential mobility was biasing population estimates in a significant way. So I continued to examine the problem during my PhD, uh, where I started investigating alternative indicators of residential mobility change. Um, one new aspect of this research, and a fairly important one at that, was the introduction of using a Bayesian approach to archeological dating. Uh, with this new addition, I decided to revisit uh, my previous research to see if the new dating approach would have an effect on the results. I'm sure it's no surprise to anyone here, but dating archeological context can be difficult. Uh, dating in some contexts might be very precise, while in others, the time spans can be quite broad. Um, I used range midpoints in my master's research, and this can be problematic at times. Um, when a midpoint uh, derived from a time span of 50 years, like Kasori E4, or a span of 100 years, like Kasori E1, might be fairly representative, using a midpoint from a 1,000-year time span, like the general middle Jomon period, is another story. Um, unfortunately, because the use of these basic Jomon periods is quite common, there were a decent number of these period-level midpoint dates included in my prior analysis. In the shift to a Bayesian approach, site dates were produced using Markov chain Monte Carlo simulations. Um, the start and end dates for each time span were used as priors, and the simulated dates were repeatedly sampled from those time spans. Um, each of these simulations were plotted, which resulted in a confidence envelope of sorts that showed a range in which the actual trend was likely to have resided. Um, there have been some more recent advances along this line that involve null uh, hypothesis testing, which are really great. Um, I was a bit tempted to update my methodology along these lines mid-dissertation, but decided it's better to finish up the PhD and circle back around to updated methodologies in the future if necessary. Um, for this re-examination, I focused strictly on the middle Jomon period in the Kanto and Chuba regions. Uh, site dates vary for every simulation, so there are instances where sites were included in the middle Jomon period in one simulation but not the next. Um, this means that only summary numbers are possible, but on average, the simulations used around 186 individuals coming from 16 sites. So here are those results. Um, these plots show the effect that adjusting the time span has on the juvenility index value trends. Uh, the top plot uh, only uses data from the middle Jomon period. There appears to be an increase in juvenility index values through most of the period, but like my master's uh, research, the confidence envelope never wholly moves beyond the stable population line. Um, in the middle plot, I included data from the entire Jomon period, but only visualized results for the middle Jomon period. Uh, the boundary expansion helps to combat edge effects, and as you can see, greatly reduce the size of the confidence envelope. The bottom plot has an expanded range that includes 1,000 years before and after the middle Jomon period, or running from 6,400 to 3,400 Cal BP. The middle and bottom plots are quite similar, and both of these plots show an important development. Both confidence envelopes move beyond the stable population line. I also tested the effect that weighting had on the analysis. Uh, for these plots, juvenility values were weighted based on the number of individuals in each grouping. Um, sites with greater number of skeletal remains were, weighed, were weighted more heavily than sites with fewer remains in an attempt to adjust for low sample sizes. 
Um, for the middle Jomon only plot on top, the weighting effect can be clearly seen around 4,900 Cal BP, where the confidence envelope is reduced and most of it is above the stable population line. Uh, like on the previous slide, the confidence envelope of both the middle and bottom plots rise rises above the stable population line, but the weighted versions here um, start this transition somewhat sooner and stay above that level for a longer duration. So long story short, uh, what are the takeaways of this re-examination? Um, the first is that using a Bayesian approach to dating and expanding timeframes beyond the middle Jomon period to counteract edge effects greatly reduced the size of confidence envelopes which helped to identify a likely period of increased birth rates. Uh, the extent and exact timing of this increase depends on how the data is treated, but either way, the general population increase signal is clear. Um, with an increase and decrease in birth rate proxies, corresponding with an increase and decrease in sites and dwellings, it seems fairly certain that the middle Jomon period boom and bust was a true population event and not strictly a byproduct of change in mobility patterns. Um, another general takeaway I got from this project was the importance of re-examining and re-evaluating prior evidence and studies. Um, I doubt this is the final examination of this line of evidence, and following studies may come up with some different conclusions, but by being open with our research, we can help to keep moving the field forward. And on that note, um, there's still some areas of improvement. Um, First, age estimations were not always clear in reports. Historically, there's a tendency to underestimate the age of older individuals and overestimate the age of younger individuals. Uh, Re-examination of remains might shift their estimated ages, which would affect the juvenility index values. Um, second, there's still room to improve the juvenility index itself. Uh, this method was originally focused on optimizing the comparison between sites and cultures, and it does that quite well. Um, however, if the goal is to create a proxy that comes as close as possible to actual birth rates, there's likely some ways to improve the measure depending on the individual circumstances of the sites. Uh, one example of this is uh, Gwen Robin's work to better utilize uh, data from individuals under the age of five. Um, in the end, this additional support of middle Jomon population events furthers the importance of trying to find out what exactly happened at the time. Um, there have been a number of studies that have examined this and a number of new studies that are currently underway, but more work is definitely needed. It's a really interesting phenomenon. Um, and lastly, the level or ease of reproducibility of this project could be improved, which takes us to the last little bit of this presentation. Um, before we finish up, I want to talk a bit about my experience in trying to make this research reproducible. Um, first of all, I don't have a formal background in coding. Um, I worked my way through some basic coding in R for my master's research, and I tried to build on that experience during my PhD, adding version control and creating a reproducible foundation for my PhD work. Um, depending on your background, this might be a minor accomplishment or considered a bare minimum effort. Um, but from my personal experience, it wasn't a small task and it was a bit of an outlier in my department. Um, of course, the, the gap between coding ability and coding standards that you strive for can be frustrating. But um, throughout the project, I tried to view it from an outlook of progress, not perfection. Um, the code might not be perfect, but the effort put into trying to make it as reproducible as possible increases its value. I see open reproducible research as an ideal that we should strive for, but I lacked the tools and knowledge to accomplish it earlier in my academic career. Um, luckily, there have been some great advances in the field, and I just want to highlight a few of the tools that I used in this project that might be helpful to anyone just getting started. Um, my path to reproducibility was heavy, excuse me, heavily influenced by Ben Marwick um, and the RR tools package in R that he produced. If you're not, <laughs> if you're not familiar with Professor Marwick's uh, RR tools package, I highly recommend you check it out. Um, the package sets up an initial formatting for the creation of a research compendium. 
And the package wiki provides an excellent step-by-step -step guide um, to work you through the process of creating the compendium, uh, setting up version control through GitHub, and creating a DOI for the project using uh, OSF. Um, Remv is another package that helped a lot and is worth a look. Um, making sure that package versions played nicely together was the bane of my existence during this project. Um, I don't know if I had some really poor timing when it came to package updates through the course of my PhD, but updating packages repeatedly wrecked my code. And so the REM package was really a lifesaver. Um, it helps to manage package dependencies, ensuring that others could match the package versions that, uh, I was using to be able to replicate the results. Um, and the last tool that helped simplify things was the use of Markdown. Um, it provided a one clip reproduction process, um, but required some workarounds in my case. Um, trying to run all the code directly in Markdown just destroyed my computer. Um, the Monte Carlo simulations paired with some replacement sampling systems uh, involved in other parts of the project um, made running the code directly in Markdown just unfeasible. Um, however, using Markdown to trigger scripts to run outside of Markdown um, significantly sped things up. And it also provided that one-click reproducibility that I was aiming for. Um, a combination of caching and running uh, MD5 checksums also helped to speed my own workflow when editing the product. project. Um, Markdown would cache results and would rerun the script if it was uh, altered at all. Um, before implementing this, I would either run bits of code kind of piecemeal or just run everything and wait for everything to run through to make sure I didn't break anything with any new additions. And that involved a lot of waiting. Um, just as I tried to improve my workflow from my master's to my PhD, there's definitely improvements I'd like to make in the future here. Um, first off, I'd like to try to create the entire papers in Markdown. Um, for my project, I tried to ensure that the data was included, the code could be rerun, and all the main figures were included and could be reproduced. Um, but the process to do all of that isn't super straightforward. Um, the tools are provided, but it takes a little work to do as opposed to everything being able to run in Markdown with a single click. Um, I also started my project before adopting a reproducible workflow and uh, using a research compendium format, which caused organizational issues. Um, I also included far too many exploratory plots in my project, which caused additional messes and organizational problems. Um, finally, in the future, I'd like to add Docker containers to my workflow. Um, this would provide a controlled, reproducible environment and hopefully bypass some of the issues and work involved in making sure that the software versions and packages matched. And that's about it. Um, here are some references to studies mentioned in the presentation. Another page of those. And um, some additional references on the software side of things. And with that, I'm uh, done. Um, thanks very much for your time. For anyone interested, the raw data and code for my PhD research can be found at the link here. Um, thanks again.